lavishly supplied, and completely protected by my Heavenly Father. I am no longer burdened with guilt, shame, or condemnation, and every benefit of God's grace is mine. I am who he says I am, and I have what he says I have. Amen. You may be seated. As I said earlier, I want to share with you today from Psalms 8. The message entitled, The Name of the King. As we've been singing this morning, there's nothing like the name of Jesus. You know, there's, there's a lot of names that if you throw them out there, people will recognize them. Some people are so famous, all you've got to have is one name. If I threw the name out there, Elvis, most of you would think of Elvis Presley. If I said Kennedy, I would throw, you throw that name out there, most of you think of the Kennedy family. Um, if I threw the name out there, Shaq, somebody would, a lot of you would think of basketball. OJ, you think of football, some of you think of the trial, different things that have happened. But there's power in a name. I know that my name means lover of horses. I never want to own one. I have no big desire to ride one. So I don't know exactly why I got named Philip, lover of horses. It's a Bible name. I got named a Bible name. Amen. But Psalm 8 was written by David. It's a, it's a psalm that talks about the majesty of God's name. Today we know that through what Jesus has done, he's been given a name that's above every other name. And when we simply call on that name, there is power. The scripture says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter what happens, everything bows at the name of Jesus. Everything bows at the name of Jesus. So today we want to look into this psalm and we want to see exactly what it tells us about the name of our King, Jesus. We're going to start out with God's name is majestic because of his glory. Psalms 8 verses 1 and 2 says this, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. David starts out this psalm simply by recognizing two names of God. The first name, if you'll notice on um, in your Bibles, a lot of the Bibles, that the first Lord, the first Lord is capitalized. That is the name of Jehovah. Jehovah, our God. That's the name of God that's above every other name and was so, was so um, holy to them that most time they wouldn't even say it. But then he goes on and says, Our Lord, our Lord, how excellent. He's talking about, Lord, you're the great God. You're your name above every other name. And then, Lord, you're the Lord of all over all the earth. We've got a God that's got a name that's powerful and holy so we can call upon him no matter what we're going through, no matter where we're at. And he's in control of all that we need today. Whatever we need, we can call upon the name of the Lord. It says, who have set your glory above the heavens. I looked up that word glory. In the Hebrew, it means the majesty or the splendor. There's something about the name of our God. The name of our God causes demons to tremble. The name of our God causes sickness to be healed. The name of our God turns things around and bring things back to life that were dead. It's in the name of Jesus that we have power today. Psalms 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. We have a God that created everything that is. A God that spoke this world into existence. He put the stars into space. He created the sun and the moon. 
He causes all of, all of this to be. We have a God that is the creator. We have a God that has a name that is above every other name. Whatever you need today, you can find it in the name of your God. The purpose of all of creation is simply, simply to magnify and declare the beauty and glory of God. It wasn't too long ago, I happened to, I probably was in the last two years, <clears throat> Louis Giglio, some of you have heard of Louis Giglio, he actually put together something where if you take sounds from different animals and you put them together and you put them at the right speed, what actually happened, he came up with almost like the tune to go along with how great is our God. The whales and different things, church, the, the, the music that they make, the sounds that they make, the trees that blow, everything that happens is put here simply to magnify God. Everything about creation points us to the greatness of God. But also we see God's glory in the helplessness. Because see that verse 2, it says this, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. There's nothing more weak than a newborn baby. Amen? They do nothing. I, I used to joke with my wife, they're, they're not even really human yet. They're just here. She goes, well, don't talk about our kids like that. But they just sleep and they just eat and they just go to the bathroom and then they sleep and they eat. And they go. It's just one complete cycle. That's all that they do for the longest time, it seems like. They're so weak and so helpless. But what he says, he says, out of the mouth of babes you have ordained strength. Our God has chosen an example of something that's weak to show us that no matter where we're at, no matter what we're going through, no matter what is happening, He can give us strength and He can bring strength. See, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, it says this, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Here's what happens. No matter what we're going through, no matter how weak we feel, no matter how down we may, things may look, God can bring strength. God can bring victory. God can bring hope. God can renew life. No matter what's going on in your situation, God is there. All you've got to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will see His glory. We see His glory in all of creation. And all He says, when you're weak, when you're discouraged, when you're down, just call upon me. I will give you strength. And what does it say there? Because of your enemy that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. David was a man that knew what it was to run from those that were trying to get him. Last week we looked in Psalms 3 when his own son Absalom was trying to take the throne. We know that Saul to chase him and tried to kill him. In fact, one scripture talks about he threw the spear and tried to pin him against the wall. We know that when he faced, went out to face Goliath, that Goliath said, I'll feed you to the birds. All we know is that in a situation when we can't do it, our God still can. He is there. He'll never let you down. He will never fail you. He's always there. The same God that can ordain strength from the mouth of babes can give you and I strength in our times of weakness. By simple words and faith, God builds a tower of strength, and that will stop the jury. <coughs> Your enemies in their tracks. The enemy has no power when the weak are made strong by our Creator. Amen? When you're at the weakest, call upon the name of your God. Call upon the name of Jesus, and He'll give you strength. But not only can we see God's name is majestic in His glory, but God's name is majestic because of His love. How many know that you're loved by God? How many really know that? How many live every day knowing that you're loved by God? Even at your worst, He still loves you. Even at your lowest, He still loves you. He's never going to let you down. He's never going to let you go. You are who He says you are. There's no other name like His name. Psalms 8, verses 3 and 4 says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You go out at night on the nights when you can actually see the stars and it's not too cloudy and, of course, not raining and 
and all that, or you're not trying to hide in the house because it's so hot. If you go out there, they say with the naked eye, you can see about 5,000 stars. They say with about a four-inch telescope, you can see about two million stars. In fact, when God was trying to show Abraham what his descendants would be, he actually took him out and said, hey, can you count the stars? That's going to be your descendants. To look at the greatness of the heavens make us, makes us see the greatness of God. David arrives at a dilemma in verses 3 and 4 that many times we don't consider. I don't know if you've ever thought about this question. He is stunned by the beauty and vastness of God's world. He asks, what is man that you remember him? The son of man that you look after him. The God that created all of this, the God that spoke this into existence, the God that took and formed every creature that is and put it in man's dominion. David says, Lord, when I look at all of this, I wonder, who am I that you even remember me? But isn't it an awesome thing that God remembers you? And he told him in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, said, I have thoughts about you. Not only did he make you, not only did he create you, but he thinks about you. He has thoughts about you. He has plans for your life. He has created you for good works. He's done all of this in your life. God cares about you. Yes, he spoke all of this into existence. He created all of this. If you ever take time and watch some of those nature channels and you see the different creatures and all of these things, you're like, wow, this is amazing what, what, what this world holds. Places, I'll never go. I'm not going to go hundreds of feet down in the ocean just to look at stuff. But I like it when other people do and they show me the pictures. And I can see what's going on down there. I don't want to go down there. But when I see it and I see all that God has done, it amazes me. But to still think that God cares about me individually. I think it's, it's in Isaiah. He says, you know me by name. He goes, you're mine. I created you. I formed you. You're mine. No matter what you go through, I'm going to be there with you. Because he cares for us. We look at that, some people say, well, how, could, how does God even think about us? See, man forfeited all the glory that God gave them in the, in the garden. The glory was forfeited, our, our relationship through the sin that Adam committed. That, that Bible says that for well, the wages of sin is death. And because of that, we lost. But the, the Bible tells us that the earth groans for redemption. See, in Romans 8, it says this, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So because of sin, people want, well, Pastor, why did all of these things happen? Why do all these bad things happen? Why? Because sin came in and everything that was here that was, was changed. And it waits for the adoption. It waits for the change. It waits for renewal. And we ourselves, we often talk about a renewal in our body, don't we? Well, when I get to heaven, I won't have this pain. Lord, take this away from me. We often talk about that. But it's waiting for a redemption and a change. It's because of what Jesus done, has done for us that we have hope. The fact that God does care about us, even with all that he's already done, should cause us to worship and to praise him. Sin separated us from the presence of God. But God, by his great mercy and his love, have brought us near through Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, you were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ. How many knows there was a time that you were without Jesus? 
I mean, he knew you, but you didn't know him. You were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were fall have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's because of his great love. It's because of the love that he showed us through that Jesus died on the cross, through taking our punishment upon him, becoming sin. See, have you ever thought about that? Your Savior, who never sinned, became sin. Not just took it upon him. He became sin. He took every sin that was of, of through all of history. It was put upon him, and he took it to the cross, and he was punished, and he was he was chastised, he was beaten, and then he died, and the father turned away because of the sin. But he took it upon him. Why? So he could bring you near through the blood that he shed. He loves you so much. He cares for you. Yes, he created the world. Yes, he sought the stars out there. Yes, he called the moon and the sun to shine. Yes, he put every sea creature that there is and every animal that walks this earth. But he loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. And it's in that name of Jesus that today there is power, that today we have hope, that today those of us that were far off and every one of us were have been brought near by the blood. Nothing you could do would bring you near to Jesus. It's near to God. It's only through the blood of His Son, Jesus, that we come near. He loved us so much. His name is powerful because of His love. Yes, He created everything. Yes, He's full of glory. But He's His love. And that's how we connect with God. Jesus came to seek and to save us. He found us in the midst of all of our sins and brought us out by His grace. Compared to the universe, we're small. You know, compared to the vastness of this universe, we're just like a piece of sand on the ocean, or out on the seashore at the ocean. But to God, we're, we're, we're something special. He gave us his best. God's name is majestic because of his glory. His name is majestic because of his love, but his name is also majestic because of his grace. I'm here glad that we have grace. Amen. God's undeserved favor on our lives. See, without grace, we've got no hope. Without grace, we would be lost. See, Psalms 8, 5 through 8 says this. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. See, in Genesis 1, 28, this is what God told them there. It goes along with this. Then God blessed them. Who's them? Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. David had this in mind in verses 5 through 8. God gave his image bearers the right to rule and have dominion over all things. Do you know who named all the animals? Adam did. Can you imagine a lion just walking up to you and you say, um, I think you can be called a lion. And then followed by the bear. I mean, when I was out at Camp Bacobac, um, the week I was there, they, they, had, they had several bear sightings in the several months leading up that. And then one night we were out doing a, an activity at night, and I'm the director. I get to make the decision. I'm responsible for what goes on. And all of a sudden I get I get a message. Um, two of your counselors, two of your workers just saw the bear and the cub. Well, what do we have? We have 70 campers out in the woods at night in the dark. And we got a bear and its cub out there. And it's saying, ha, ha, ha. human sticks, not fish sticks or <laughs> cheese sticks. So we had to ring the bell to get them all back. But imagine Adam, namely, he had, he, 
did. I want you to subdue these things. They're, un they're under your rule. But then sin came in and everything was changed. And you can see now, it's very clear through the Bible and through history that man's not ruling anymore. There is chaos and there's pain and there's death. The author of Hebrews makes the point that man is not currently ruling all things. See, in Hebrews chapter 2 it says this, For you have placed everything under his authority. This means that God has left nothing outside the control of his Son. Even if presently we have yet to see this accomplished. But we see Jesus, who as a man lived for a short time, lower than the angels, and has now been crowned with glorious honor because of what he suffered in his death. For it was by God's grace that he experienced death bitterness on behalf of everyone. See, we're not in control of things, are we? We're not in control of what goes on in this world. And God has, has allowed these things to happen. His son gave up his rulership of, of this earth, even though God's ultimately in control of everything. There are things that happen here that are not God's design for this world. People wonder, well, Pastor, why did this disaster happen? Why did this hurricane? That's not God's design. It's because of the sin and the chaos and the pain that came in with sin that these things happen. But we need a Savior. All of these things keep pointing us to the fact that we need a Savior. And the only one that can be our Savior is Jesus. Jesus came. He died on the cross. And because of what he did, we find grace today. We find mercy through him. And because of that, even though the world is in chaos, the world brings a lot of pain and sorrow and suffering, he is still our answer. He is still in our lives. He gives us his grace. And through it all, he's going to bring us through. It's in his name. He took our punishment. And it's in grace God sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. And by raising him from the dead, bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. I'm going to read part of that passage that chant read this morning during the, the worship. But I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. So it's going to sound a little different, but follow along. Starting in verse 6. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. I just listened to a message this past week by a minister named Leon Fontaine. When we get to heaven, we're going to be able to see the scars that Jesus has in his hands and his feet. We're going to see those. We're talking about, you know what, when I get to heaven, my ache's going to be gone, my pain's going to be gone, whatever's crippled's going to be made right. But when we get to heaven, there's going to be one that still carries the scars of what happened in this world. And that's going to be our Savior. Yes, he was. He lived in the Spirit. But when he came, he took on a human form. And we're going to see him. And it says here, he became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to his name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. And every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God his Father. Church, right now it seems like everything's out of control, but we're still in his hands. He is holding you today. And because you know him as Jesus, because you've been saved by his blood, your sins are gone, you're now a child of God. He holds you in his hand. He will never let you go. You may feel like you're going under. You may feel like you're never going to reach the end. But just call upon the name of Jesus. And no matter what's happening in your life, it bows at the name of Jesus. No matter what's going on, it falls at the name of Jesus. That name is greater than any other name. Just hold on to that and call on that name of Jesus. His name is the most majestic name in all of the earth. I don't care... I don't care where you go. 
If you say in the name of Jesus, you're going to get people to say, praise the Lord. You're going to get people to curse at you. You're going to get people to walk away. Or some people have a reaction to the name of Jesus. Some people say, well, he wasn't real. There is no doubt historically that Jesus was a real person. There is no doubt that Jesus died on the cross. Some people will try to say he didn't rise, but it is a historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And it is now true that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for you today. And no matter what you're going through, he's saying, Father, you're, you're, they're your child. Father, you just continue to bless them. Father, hold them. You hold on to them tight because they're going to make it through. Through Jesus, through him. His name is the most majestic. By his death and the salvation he brought to us, we are crowned with glory and honor. He is our Savior. We must and must be crowned with the honor and glory as our rightful King. David closes with these final words. And I want you to read this scripture with me, would you please? Read it out loud with me. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. There is no other name like the name of Jesus. There's no other name. You can walk the streets of Stanton and just walk up and down and say, what do you think about Philip? And you know what they'll do? They'll say, Philip who? Randall, I don't mean this against you at all, but if I walked up and down the streets of Stanton and said, what do you think about Randall? Who's Randall? I can even say, what do you think about Randall Kennedy? And you're like, who's he? And I'll find some of them. Oh, I know him. I know him. There'll be some people that know us. But if you walk up to people and ask them, what do you think about Jesus? You're going to get a response. His name brings a response. Let me share this with you as I close. In April of 2013, someone named Robert Galbraith released a crime novel called Cuckoo's Calling. I've never read it, never heard of it before this, but I, I like this story. It barely sold 500 copies in a few months. In fact, uh, store owners were about ready to pull the book off the shelf. But then something happened on July the 14th that changed everything. It was announced that Robert Galbraith was actually the author J.K. Foley who actually published the book um, with that Harry Potter. You know what happened with that book, Cuckoo's Calling, that has only sold about 500 copies? All of a sudden, it sold out. It went to the top of several bestseller lists. They couldn't keep it. What was the difference? They found out that Robert Galbraith was actually author of the Harry Potter series. It was just a, a pseudo name that she was using to, to, to distinguish the book. I actually looked this up and, and it's true. She just said, I want this is a different type of book. I wanted to know people to judge it based on that, not on the other stuff that I've done. But what's the point? Robert Galbraith meant nothing to people. But the author, um, J.K. Rowling, than everything. Church, I want you to understand this. There's lots of names in this world, but there's something different about the name of Jesus. The mention of Jesus should launch our hearts into worship. His name is majestic in all the earth. He is the king in worship that we trust and that we treasure. The name of Jesus changes everything. Trust in that name of Jesus. It's a name above every other name. Full of glory. Full of love. Full of grace. Trust in that name. Would you bow your heads? Father, we want to thank you that we have that name of Jesus. Lord, your son who came and died for us, died on the cross, rose from the dead, today is alive at your right hand, interceding for us. And Lord, when things look bad, 
when things look down. Lord, we can call upon that name and always find him there. Lord, you are the answer for every situation in our life. We don't have to know the answers because we know who is the answer, and that's Jesus. Lord, there are some here today. Lord, some that may be watching that are looking for answers. They've tried everything. they tried everyone. But still they search. Lord, the answer that you gave us was Jesus. And to simply call upon his name. To cast all of our cares and our burdens upon him. And let him take control. Lord, today we give you control. And we call upon your name. That's above every other name. With your heads bowed. I want to ask you the most important question you'll ever answer in this life. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you given Jesus your life? Have you asked him to be Lord of your life? See, sin separated us from God. But Jesus came to reconcile us back to him and to redeem us from sin. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to pray a prayer right now. And according to Romans, it said simply that if you'll confess the Lord Jesus Christ and that, you'll, that you believe that he rose from the dead, it says you shall be saved. So if you've never prayed this prayer, you've never accepted Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer and let him come into your life, take away all of your sin. If you're here today and you have prayed this prayer in the past, I want you to pray with those who may be praying for the first time. We're believing that God is going to work in every heart today. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, according to your word, I am saved. My sins are gone. I'm a child of God. Thank you, Lord, for changing my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand right now? If you prayed that prayer for the first